Welcome to Pirate Living Podcast. We are your hosts, Kristen and Karan. On this podcast, we are highlighting ordinary people living extraordinary lives. These are pirates who take small, bold actions daily to create social change. Pirate life is all about rebelling and breaking the rules for good. Creating lasting social change starts by first breaking our inner rules. After all, the hardest rules to break are your own. The pirates we highlight have dedicated themselves to creating good trouble. Joining us today is James Berg. James runs a pirate marketing content crew, which has been built on pirate principles. In fact, the con- company name Picaroons, which literally means to act like a pirate. James and his crew even created the launch animation and graphics for how to be more pirate. James is also the host of a really cool podcast that I've gotten into, Chats with Dad, where James chats with his father, sought after speaker and trainer Phil Berg, all about all things business. And he has yet another podcast coming out with a real life pirate, which I can't wait to hear more about. James, we're really excited to have you on our podcast today. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so now you've taken piracy to the next level here with your business name, the way you've put your crews together and the way you conduct your business. And we would really love for you to weave us the tale of your Picaroon journey. Okay. Yeah. I'll try and keep it as short as possible. It's just mm-hmm. stop me at any point, but I suppose I worked in kind of advertising and PR agencies in London for about five or six years. And I kind of was there when it was starting to, really grow with the strategic side of social media marketing. And what I was seeing was so many organizations, big organizations where with all sorts of brands chasing likes and followers and what I call kind of empty metrics. Mm. And also what we were doing a lot of the time was, and I can say this now because I don't work with them, but for some of these big brands, it's like the products and services aren't things that people desperately need their everyday products and you're putting this amazing social media marketing on things that makes things that people don't really need look really good and really creative so where I just started thinking without much guidance necessarily was just questioning a bit just saying why why are we always chasing these likes and followers like you said before I do a podcast with my dad and he came from a background where he sold carpets on a market stool so he's very straight to the point and okay, this graphic looks beautiful, but I don't care, like, how much money is it going to make me? Mm -hmm. And that got me thinking more about social media and how it can be used for actions to, whether it's money, whether it's actually changing behavior for charities in a kind of positive way. And it just kind of set me off on this journey a bit of kind of questioning the way things were done. Is there a better way? Constantly thinking I could present those solutions, but then seeing someone else do the solution earlier and thinking oh, it's got to be a better way. And I was young, I was starting off. So I thought I'm probably just being a bit cocky, a bit again, ahead of myself. I, I can't be right with this. And then it just kind of moved into a point of, I ended up writing a book. So kind of without boring you on this stuff, I had some personal health issues and that led to me being stuck on the sofa, not being able to be active for a while. And that led to, okay, what can I do to fill this time? And I basically wrote a social media ideas book. And it came from seeing that a lot of people, my belief was that there was a lot of very effective advice that was delivered in a very complex way, all buzzwords. And for people like me that understood social media marketing, it was good and it helped us move forwards. But to everyone else, they wouldn't understand it. And likewise, to other people, when it was more simple social media advice, that was also extremely ineffective. It was things like, say good morning to your fans every day which if you've got Bob the plumber every day tweeting out, good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning, it's too much. So I kind of found, wanted to break the rule of social media has to be done in a really smart way and just getting straight to the point. I kind of found that middle ground, which was effective advice delivered in a really simple, easy to understand way. And that started with my book, And my book started giving me the confidence to kind of do a few more things. And that was when the book Be More Pirate came out. Mm. So before that, I'd always call myself a pirate more for the fun and games. And I like to jump around and cause a bit of trouble every now and then. Mm. (laughs) Whereas that book came out, it really helped me, as we've kind of spoke about before, of 
everything where you said before about breaking those good rules and causing that good trouble, it kind of gave me the permission to do that. That book obviously written by Sam Conniff. And it just, it was a load of things in there, which I thought, these are things I've thought, but I've never known how to put them in a more intelligent way or a more just straight to the point way. So things like the fact that freelance crews can work or remote working or the fact that actually, why can't you have fun while doing business? And why can't things be so stupidly efficient that actually they almost sound daft how easy they are and that book kind of formed on this journey of creating picaroons I always wanted to do my own thing my aim was always to be able to work from a laptop from wherever I wanted but I ne didn't necessarily plan for it to be a company and when I ended up leaving my last job off the back of the book there are a lot of people asking me to help them with their social media marketing and my first client was a kite surfing lodge in South Africa. So I went off there for a month and really lived the pirate life, mm -hmm. worked with them. And going back to the pirate thinking of what we apply throughout the business is they had no budget. It was a friend of mine. He had the lodge. So I said, look, I know you have no budget for me to do these high level creative things. But if I create content for you on my phone and I give you some basic strategy, that will be more effective than what you're doing right now. Whereas when I was in a big brand or a big company, sometimes you'd turn someone like that away. But mm. I got to go on all these amazing experiences in Cape Town with him and around South Africa, created content for him that was so simple, but then it instantly increased the amount of people booking him for his tours. And that's what really got me thinking of like, okay, I'm onto something here of, we haven't got to do things the way that they're always done. And that really, that plus Sam's book really gave me the permission to go, I don't go out of my way to do things differently. And I wouldn't say that's the nature of the business, but it's more that we don't think what's the way it's supposed to be done. And this is what I believe the pirate mantra is. It's like, what's the best thing to do right now? What's the best thing to do? And that those steps have just led to us doing very quickly in about a year and a half. And in about three or four months of launching, we end up working with Facebook. Mm. So we end up getting a project from them, which was like, okay, even though that's a big corporation and I want to work with all mix of companies that gives us the credibility to get in more other organizations. And then that meant, okay, I now don't need to chase after big corporations because we've got that box ticked. And the way we're at now, as you kind of said before, is we're working with a real life pirate on trying to bring his story to life as potentially like a Netflix film, a book. We're doing a podcast with him to help launch that. I've got the podcast with my dad. I potentially got a speaking company with my dad coming up. We've got something we're looking at in the NFT, the kind of crypto space, crypto art. And then on the real Picaroon side, Picaroon has formed into this kind of creative collective. Because what would happen is where I'd start off of giving people advice on their social media marketing, people would start saying, well, now you've given me the advice. Can you just run it or make it for me? And that's where I built out using the pirate analogy of the network to keep our overheads low, to mean that I could still work remotely and travel and do the fun things I wanted. I basically built out a freelance network of creatives, animators, videographers, they're through recommendations, they're people I've found online, they're people I've worked with in the past. A few of them still work for big agencies, but they just moonlight with me. Again, that was one of my pirate things that I knew that when you're in a big agency, a lot of the creatives are doing bits or jobs on the side for friends so I thought why not be open about that and kind of say that we do that we obviously don't name them just in case they get in trouble but we use them for that and it's really more than this thing where we create content for people whether that's any of those things we said we can bring it to life and it means we work with charities we work with a lot of social enterprises but then we do have a few big brands we're currently working with a Hollywood animation studio just had a film come out called River Dance, So we work on the film and the real thing and focus for me and where I want us to grow and keeping the pirate spirit alive is like what you guys have said that is that you do a bit more of working with people who have an amazing story to tell and helping get that story out there instead of, as I said before, working with brands and products that people don't really need and convincing them they need it. It's helping. I have no issue in using social media or websites, we don't just do social media anymore. We do websites, videos, about us videos, all sorts of content, podcasts. I have no problem in using those mediums 
to what is essentially manipulate people to take an action, which is an increase in sales donations or leads for organizations, which I believe in. And that I believe that I have no issue in convincing someone they need to go and speak to this specific council, or they should go and engage with this organization, or they should listen to the story of this amazing pirate. So that's kind of what I've built with Pickaroons. And even though that was a long explanation, that's still the short version of it. There's <laughs> some amazing things going on. I kind of really do. Uh, I'm very thankful kind of everything that's come for and all the people that have been involved and supported it. And when I've sometimes gone up to them with what must seem like some quite crazy <laughs> ideas that they've come back and believed in it and kind of backed us and given us the chance. How, how long has Pickerons been around? So I officially launched it in January of 2020. So just for oh. the pandemic, which wow. wasn't ideal. <laughs> um, but I had the name. So when I launched my book, I think it was two years before that, in two, November 2017, when I launched my book, I knew I wanted the book to be a kind of starting point for something bigger. I didn't know at that point what it was going to be. Mm -hmm. um, and I looked for company names and I'd, I don't think I'd read Sam's book then, but maybe I had. Maybe I had just read it. But either way, originally I was going to call the company Scallywags. Mm -hmm. And I'm mm -hmm. so glad that that was taken already as a company <laughs> name. I couldn't. That would have been an awful name for Pickaroons. <laughs> yeah, Pickaroons was the, I looked up synonyms for pirate because I knew it had to be called something to a pirate. And yeah, Pickaroons was there. So I launched Pickaroons then. Mm. Didn't end up having the logo, which is the pirate skull, the blue that we've got. That all came in. So I left my job in September of 2019 and basically kind of went into hiding for three or four months. Went to Cape Town and kind of worked on that client to get a case study work with an amazing organization called Behind Bras, and that's for women who are in prison, uh, mm -hmm. training them in fashion and textiles so they can move into employment. Mm -hmm. Worked on those two and one or two other little projects kind of in quiet so I could get some case studies up and taste, test out some of our theories. And I was in Berlin for a month, um, basically in hiding, just building the website, building the brand, what are our values? And then, yeah, I ended up launching the business in January 2020. Wow, so you've done a lot in a year and a half with that with yeah. with Pickaroons. It's quite impressive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, uh, thank you. Yeah, it's especially been, during a pandemic. It's been <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I suppose like now you say that, I don't really get chance to like sit back and think what's been achieved at the time because it's just go go go. But mm -hmm. like I said, I'm very thankful all the time, but I don't always sit back and go, yeah, this is quite amazing what's happened. But yeah, I suppose you said that it is like it was right before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. I, I just I, my belief is content is just the best thing in the world for your business it doesn't matter what you do I made a book I was a junior in a uh, PR agency I should not have been writing a book but I had an idea and I went I'm going to go and write a book I'm not going to wait for that and the podcast I did with my dad I, sh I just launched my own business like a month if that but I was like I've got an idea I'm going to go for it and mm -hmm. when I look back through everything we've done and a lot of organizations I've seen and we work with my belief is that a lot of people wait till they are made it till they're really big to launch the podcast, to launch the book, to do the video, to get on camera. They wait till they're big. Cause it's like, I, sh I don't deserve to do this yet. Or I'm not important enough. Whereas my thing was if we make those things instead and I'm okay. And it's kind of a pirate thinking as well as I'm okay to maybe be wrong. I'm okay mm -hmm. to put myself out there and not got it, get it spot on. That that will lead to more opportunities. And our thing's always been about, trying to get one more thing, always leveling up. So it's things like once we've got Facebook, okay, now we've got that credibility, that's going to help with some of the charity work we do. And with some of the charities we've done, once we work with one charity and we've made one video, that gets the next one. And when we worked with Sam on his second book, on Sam and Alex on the Be More Pi How to Be More Pirate, it was like, okay, well, that's now helped elevate us with that community. And it's, it's all these pieces of content we've done. I can literally, literally trace some things back to some of the smallest pieces of content we've made. This Hollywood animation studio, we made a five minute pitch video for this real life pirate, Captain, actually no, we are saying his name. We are saying his name now, Captain Tones. So for the real life pirate, we made a five minute pitch video to try and be used for that, to try and get it in and show it to people. That came from the Be More Pirate Network because I'd worked with Alex before she recommended us to 
Darren who was looking at that. So that came from that. So we did the work for Alex, which led to the work with the pirate. The work with the pirate, the video we made, we made it in a really creative, different kinetic text style, which is basically when the text flies in from all around. That video was then seen by a producer at this Hollywood animation studio who got in touch and said, I'd like to speak to you about doing something for us. Mm -hmm. That conversation led to actually, you don't just want a video, you need a whole brand strategy. That conversation led to the film that went, and it's, I look back through these things and I like, actually, I can trace these things back to the smallest piece of, whether it's a blog, whether it's a, the book. And it's, that's my real belief is really people, a lot of the people I meet with this kind of pirate mindset, I know you're speaking to, they've got amazing stories. And I would much rather than I work with a lot of the charities that we do work with, we say, look, get yourself on camera. When I say camera, I mean, get your phone up and speak into your phone. You won't have the budget to go and create a high level video right now. Mm -hmm. So I'd much rather you went and spoken to your phone and at least got a bit of your story out, which will help one, get you more confident at speaking to the phone. So when eventually we do put a camera in front of you, you've had that practice. But two, just by doing your story, even if it's an amateur way, it's gonna get you out there. And we did one recently with a company I consulted with called Paper Cup Project. They're amazing. They're trying to build, uh, they're trying to start a coffee shop in Liverpool for people who are previously homeless are working in there. They train them, they work there. I said to the amazing founder, look, get yourself a video. She messaged me saying, I just did a video that just said, here's what we've been up to the last couple of weeks. And she got something like 10,000 organic views on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't always tell people to follow the views, mm -hmm. but it's more that that just shows you it wasn't five views and loads of people sending her hate mail, but <laughs> it can achieve things when you just put yourself out there and using the pirate stuff it's like being brave i'd much rather not do any of this <laughs> i'd much rather just sit in the back go surf all day not actually have to work but it's by making content across any industry that's what gets you out and gets your story in front of the right people mm -hmm. i'm thinking like as far as uh, putting the phone up that is that is a brave like small bold and brave thing to do because I, there have been so many times too where I'm like, I don't want to, I don't want to <laughs> put my phone in yeah. front of my face, get on Instagram and tell a story. And yeah, that's a, that's definitely a brave action. Absolutely. I mean, I, I feel horrible just talking to you now about myself. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think it's like, it's like, why am I, I'm just talking about me and my story and like what Pickaroons have done. And, but I, I, I have the confidence now to know what these things can lead to. And as I said, and again, a pirate thing we do is not about, I don't need 10,000 people following me. But if one person who listens to this gets in touch with us and then asks us to help make a video or something for them, that's a massive result for me. Because I now, as I said to you, I view that one person as a link to another 10 people and so on. So it gives me the confidence of, okay, even though it doesn't feel right, I've done a few podcasts now. I'm much more relaxed speaking to you. Whereas with the first ones, I was thinking, oh, what should I say? And how do I say it? And <laughs> that's the thing that, even if no one watches it, I say to people, even if no one's going to watch it, it's just going to be your mum or your nan or someone that loves you anyway going, oh, I saw it and you're amazing. <laughs> that doesn't matter because you getting the practice of making content. And sometimes when people don't even watch it, I always said to people, I don't actually, I know how many people have bought my book, but I don't actually know how many people have read my book. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure there's a lot of them that have bought it and have never read it. And there's a lot more people that have seen that I'm an author but they've never read my book and they don't even know if it's good. And it's almost like by doing it, by saying we do a podcast, by saying we do this, here's a blog post we wrote. You're just reminding people of what it is you know about, what it is you do. I'm sure you guys get a lot of people talking to you about like pirates, purely <laughs> because you speak about pirates. Like what you put out there is then going to come back to you. So when I geek out essentially on content, on videos, on pirates, those opportunities then come straight back to me. Yeah, definitely. When I mean, a lot of what you said really resonates with um, the work that Kristen and I do as coaches um, from, like I said, taking action, taking messy action um, and the the the, the phrase that action dispels overwhelm. Sometimes we have these big goals, these big things that we want to do and we get we get stuck. We get what is it? Paralysis by analysis. And yeah. we do nothing. So are, we never 
we don't achieve our goals or, or they take a lot longer than, um, than we want them to, because we, we don't take the necessary action. And we, like you said, you wait for it to be perfect, um, or to, for the right time or whatever stars to align before you actually do the thing rather than just doing the thing and being okay with the fact that you might be doing the wrong thing. But at least yeah. you're doing a thing. <laughs> right? Yeah, and it's, it's progression. It's progression. Like yes. I said, I keep so where I'm at, at the moment, we'll kind of go surfing in this place that I live. And it, the same thing, I was talking with a friend the other day, and it was like, actually, as long as every day I'm progressing, even if it's not the perfect waves, you go out and you go, okay, it's not perfect, but where the waves, waves were messy and horrible, I then learn even more about how to handle those waves. Mm -hmm. So now I feel more comfortable in that for when there is that perfect opportunity. I'm then ready because I'm more experienced from doing that. And like you said, I love that. It's, it's never going to be perfect. And that's the thing I think the real pirate mindset to me is like, just go off to get that treasure. Believe you're eventually going to get there. There's a really nice saying I like, which is um, smooth seas don't make skillful sailors. Mm -hmm. I change it to be smooth seas don't make skillful pirates because mm -hmm. I prefer to be a pirate than a sailor. But it's that thinking of like, it's being okay, and this is something I worked on recently with um, Sam, who obviously wrote Be More Pirate, his project, The Uncertainty Experts. We worked on some of the promotions for that, some of the videos, and that's the concept of The Uncertainty Experts. It was learning to be okay with the fact that it's not going to be okay. It's going to be messy. There's going to be horrible times ahead. You're going to learn some horrible lessons. There's going to be ups and downs, but it's knowing that if you are willing to go for that, and like I said, at the moment, I mean, at the moment, I'm feeling very positive because everything's going very well. <laughs> Maybe in a month or two, there might be some bad campaigns. We might muck up and I'll be feeling less positive. But right now I'm kind of in the mindset, like I say, look, when I look back to all those downs and there's, over the last year and a half, there's been so, so many. Mm -hmm. There's also been so many more ups and they are all now that I'm in the up situation saying they're all worth it. Because it's like, actually, the skills that I've now got, I've got problems presenting to me now almost daily, where some of them a year ago or six months ago even, that same problem would have come up with a client and I'd have had to spend days trying to sort it, figure out what to do, speaking to people, feeling awful. Whereas now, because of that experience, I'm either doing things to avoid that problem even happening or I just now know exactly, right, I've been here before. I've been in these messy seas, like I know how to get around it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're getting the reps in. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, oh, and the uncertainty, like that's something that this past year, if, if any lesson has been learned, is that there's loads and loads of uncertainty out there. And are we going to be okay with um, embracing the uncertainty and moving forward despite not knowing what's going on? Or are you going to like bury yourself inside, shut all the doors and refuse to go out into the world? So yeah, yeah. that's a big lesson to learn. Absolutely. It was, I remember when like COVID hit and I'd, so I was in Morocco for a month just before COVID hit. I was surfing, pickaroons were starting to take off. I was starting to get some bigger clients and I was like, wow, this is the life. Like this is, this is what I wanted. Like, let's see where we can go with this. I was going to be coming back to the UK for a week or two. And I think I was due to go to LA to do a load of talks in all the different WeWorks. So I had like six or seven talks booked in. I was like, this is really going to grow Picaroons. Cause when I get to do talks, it's always an easy way for me to meet people. And we always get clients off the back of it. And then obviously I got back to London and then there was the rumors of this COVID thing happening and then within like a week, I was back at my parents, locked down, and five, six months, I was just there. And because my nan uh, was a lot older, like we were proper shielding. So I was properly locked down for like five, six months, gone from like this dream that I'd always been working towards the surfing. As I said, I was supposed to go to LA, which was going to open a lot of doors for us as a business. I was supposed to be going to Berlin to work with a really cool nightclub a uh, beach club client we we're going to be working with that, that was going to open a lot of doors and all of a sudden that was gone and i'm saying this more now because i can reflect on it but at the time i hardly gave any thought to it it was just like right boom change direction let's go like if i'm going to be locked down for i didn't know six months but like i am just gonna work whereas when i was in morocco i would 
take a few more breaks through the day to go surf and have fun. Mm -hmm. I was like, I'm going to head down, work and move this business forwards. And things like we made a resource, which was like how 31 ideas, I think how you can help uh, how you 31 ideas, I think to promote your business. Another one was like 25 ideas on how you can help small businesses. And we turned those around within like a few days of businesses starting to have to close down in the pandemic with some of the pickaroons. And we just very quickly like, right, what's in front of us? Let's use this, like you said, this uncertainty. And it was, it was tough. There's a lot of tough days, like working that hard for that long without any real breaks. And when you do have a break, maybe sit in the garden, it was just relentless. But it's like, like you guys said, what's then been built from that? Not that I knew it would end up like this, but it was almost like this is what I was working towards. It's not a, it's not an accident that the way Pickaroons is running now, because that's what kind of sacrificed and worked towards. Mm -hmm. I know from uh, listening to your podcast that one of the main themes for you is fun. Um, how do um, how do you infuse fun into the work that you do with with uh, with your your pirate crew? Yeah, that's a very good question. So I suppose there's kind of, there's two sides of fun, which really we use at Pickaroons and it's the type of clients we like to work with. And the first side is the more positive and it's, we'd like to do stuff kind of, we make skate videos and working with the real life pirates, tell his amazing, amazing story. Um, there's that side of fun. And then that's kind of where we do like remote working, flexible working for everyone and make sure they're having fun. Then the other side of fun to me, which is a bit more dark, is almost it's the negative side. So it's for people who are in a very bad place going through tough times to them. And I know it's from kind of personal experience in the past of fun is just being able to sit and have a cup of tea and not have to worry about X massive health issue or it's just being at a particular place. So that side of fun to me is that's where we do a lot of work with charities and organizations is it's just helping people not feel miserable. So it's almost like the opposite of mm -hmm. that. So that's kind of the two sides. And then in terms of the general working, my thing is just, it's the flexibility to, and I've mentioned before a couple of times, like being active and doing surfing, getting out and about, and it's having that flexibility. So if I tell you on Monday, I was working probably from about eight or nine in the morning till about 7 p.m. and then I went for a surf and then I came back at 9 30 and worked till 12. Mm -hmm. Now I don't want to do that all the time but by doing that I'm working on another book with someone and we then got to spend a whole day work on the book yesterday and it was a much more relaxed day and I knew that by taking that sacrifice on Monday that would set me up for a much more relaxed day yesterday and then it's looking like the rest of this week I don't want to jinx it but could be a bit more relaxing because I did that. Mm -hmm. So it's almost giving people and all the people that we work with, we don't do time-based. So I don't do, we don't kind of say, look, how many days have you spent on this to the creatives? We obviously budget for a certain amount of days to help us with the project planning, but it's almost like, right, here is the deadline that I need this by. That might be in a week's time. That might be in four days time. We agree it with them. I don't care what time they log on, what time they log off. I don't even care if it takes them one hour to do the whole project because it's more about I'd rather as a creative that they'd gone out, done a run, done a surf, done a whatever, seen some friends, and then in one hour give me the perfect piece of work than put 10, 12 hours into a project that then doesn't turn out well. So that's kind of an, at the moment because we are still kind of in startup phase. I'm definitely doing more hours than I'd like to. But that's what I'm working towards as fun is having a little bit more time to get out and do the things which I enjoy, which to me, it's being active. It takes, I can't be thinking about a client issue if there's a wave about to mm -hmm. smash me in the face. <laughs> <laughs> and like getting out and finding things that are fun is really where that creative process breeds. So if you are looking to be creative, shutting yourself in front of, in a room for like 12 hours, trying to hammer something out, works however there's also a possibility of it taking a lot less time when you're able to find those different things find that fun and get out and play absolutely yeah yeah i think it's like you said it's, it's finding as well what you don't like i think it's uh, with all creativity it's and with all a lot of things in life i think it's about 
exploring and trying all the different things. And going, yeah, this is what works for me. This is what doesn't. So I know that even if I, I can work late, I can't get up and work early. I can't. My dad can get up at five in the morning and do work when he's got a lawn. I can't. I need to have a, I don't even have a lie and I wake up around seven, but as in, I can't set my alarm for six. So if we've got a client deadline, I have to stay up late to get it done because I can work into the night and keep the energy going. But if I wake up too early, then I've dipped in my energy through the day. And like you said, it's as long as, and I've, I've been guilty of it so many times, especially through lockdown of like, I'll go for a run later. I'll go and do a workout later. I'll go for a walk later, but then work and things hit and I don't. Mm -hmm. So I've kind of learned, like, I can't do that. So I have to do it in the morning. And if I don't do it in the morning, so I'm lucky out here, I've got a few friends that are kind of trainers and things. So like, I'll book in for like a class with them. So like once or twice a week, just because it means I have to get out at 12. There's no excuse. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of those things of learning almost what are your own, not short, I suppose not shortcomings, but in a way it is like what are your own issues and what's, and it goes down, it sounds daft, but it's like a small, it's like, what, what food do you, if I can't have, if things are stressful, if I have like pizza for lunch, I'm like low, I'm still lost of energy. Whereas if I eat healthy through the day, in the evening, late in the evening, I have a really good food and that's what I'll look forward to, to get me through that long shift. Mm -hmm. And it's just all those little tricks and tips that I think that you find for yourself instead of here is the way you must work. Because people are different, people respond to different things. And I just think, yeah, and that's where one of my things of the workplace, that remote working and COVID has kind of proved that we were doing this anyway. Mm -hmm. It's proved like you don't need to commute into London or whatever main town every day for two hours and you can get it done from home and spend more time with your kids and your family and have a bit more mm -hmm. off time. Yeah, and not having a physical location also allows you and Picaroons to work with people um, have creatives from all over the world, really, um, so that you can pick, you know, get the best of the best uh, working with you if they don't have to commute to, you know, a brick and mortar building yeah. to do the work, right? So it gives you that flexibility, which sounds like a, a huge um, theme. And what you're saying is really just having that flexibility and um, to to get things done with who you want to get on the project and when it needs to be done so yeah that's so true you know no one's ever realized that about pickaroons you're the first person who said that so yeah that's a that's a big thing for me so it's not having to fly someone out it means that if i if i meet i i have it sounds weird the way i say it but i have no loyalty to anyone in the crew because mm -hmm. they're all freelance mm -hmm. so obviously i'll fight a bear for all of them i love them they're amazing mm -hmm. but there's none of them that will ever turn around to me and go, oh, what the hell? I saw you did a project. Why was I not the videographer on that? Why mm. was I not the editor on that? Because that's just not the way it works. And they all know this. Mm -hmm. So it means, like you said, that so out here in Portugal, like the, there's a few local opportunities. And I've met, just through friends, a few local filmers. And I really like their style. And they're really sorted. They're, so they're, they're really, they've got the style that will link up with like small surf type this type of vibe whereas then i've got london creatives who are much more suited to some of the creative we do there the charities and it means that i don't go oh do you know what i've got to use this person mm -hmm. and also it means and what i like in a, in a nice way is that at any moment i could throw anyone overboard so <laughs> i could at any moment luckily we've only had like two maybe a few mostly two so far where the pick rooms if they haven't done the work to the standard that we asked for they cause a lot of issues mm -hmm. and I didn't then have to go oh do you know I've hired this person I've got to sit this straight it's just like right and when I say throw them overboard it's not that horrible I just <laughs> don't bring them onto another project mm -hmm. but it means that it, it's a nice thing that you can very easily cut ties but also with the kind of pirate analogy find new people for the crew because it means that it puts that kind of good pressure on the people in the crew to keep their game up because at any moment I might find someone better than them mm -hmm. which so far for most of them I haven't they're brilliant but they know that and again that means they've always and again this goes back to my thing of it's being honest with like the nature of the nature of work and what I found that with freelance is that if I'm just charging someone my day rate there's no incentive for me to do the best job because mm -hmm. if I do an okay job and then you need, you go, all right, well, we need some more reviews on this. Well, I get paid another day to make the reviews. And for you as a client, 
if there's no like hard stop in the way that the project works, you aren't going to necessarily review my work crisp. And for the creative, I said, always say it, they might be the laziest person in the world. If I say to them, regardless of whether this project is one round of revisions or five rounds, here is the price you're going to get paid. And we always agree that we say, look, here's how many rounds of revisions. So normally we do about two rounds Mm -hmm. because that's what the clients agree to. That's here's what you're going to get paid. If they do an amazing job, and it's only one round of revision, the creative still gets paid the same. I still get paid the same. The client still pays us the same. So it's actually, it's in my interest to do a really good brief because I don't want to have to spend time rewriting the brief for round two and round three. It's in the creative's interest to do good work because they don't want to have to work. They want to be able to get paid two or three days or how many days work for half a day's work. And it's in the client's interest to review it properly because if they don't, we've made it very clear of if you go more rounds above this, we're going to charge you by X amount more. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of that honesty. And this, again, I think goes back to the pirate of the pirates were honest about the fact that they were a bunch of just <laughs> rule breakers, a <laughs> bunch of rogues. So they had to have laws and things in place to keep things in check. Mm-hmm. So I'm not going to lie about the fact that I know that a lot of the creatives aren't going, oh, you wouldn't have to pay us and we'd still do this work. That's not the case. They need payment. Mm -hmm. So actually, how can we incentivize them? How can I incentivize ourselves to get the job done as well as possible, as quick as possible, without doing it quickly and poorly and keeping that quality high? And I just think that's what we've managed to do in that flexibility. And yeah, like you said, it's by being able to get anyone and everyone linked onto the crew wherever I go. It excites me because it means like I've there's like a never ending supply of meeting creatives and if they're better than my guys then yeah great you're going to be pretty exceptional for me to want to change them for my guys now and then the, my eventual aim is that we've got so many different creatives that so at the moment we've probably got five or six graphic designers who we call on a lot now what's nice is dependent on the brief i have i will pick specific designers so there's some designers who their style is much more suited to a particular type of client or a particular type of charity or a particular challenge they've got. Others who have a style that suited something else. So it means that, again, going back to the incentives, I can pick them based on, if I know one designer is particularly into food, I can give them only briefs that they want to work on anyway, which as a result means they're going to get higher quality things. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of just meaning that my, my takeaway from Pirates as well a lot of times is that everyone wins. The client mm-hmm. wins, I win, the creatives win. There's no one in that process. If they're staying up till two in the morning, it's because they surfed all day and they chose that themselves because they're still getting paid the same amount. Mm-hmm. If they, the client is always going to be happy with the work we delivered, they're not going to think, oh, I got stitched up with those guys. Because to me, if they're not happy, that's how they're not going to come back to us for more work or recommend us to other people. And for me, it's almost like my my input on it has been based on how well was the work. So that's kind of my thing. It's always incentivizing everyone in a completely honest way. So what, what would you say, I mean, piracy is all about rebelling. So what would you say is um, the rebellion or the social rebellion that, that you're doing with your work with Pickeroons? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I suppose it's, I suppose part of it's the fun it's making sure that it's fun for everyone. And when I say fun, I said to you there before, it's that two sides of fun of not being frustrated, but also really enjoying it. Like I'm not going to lie and say we're all sat here at our computer writing emails at 10 o'clock with a big smile on our face. (laughs) But it's that fact that you can talk about things in a lighthearted way. You can get out there and do things. And I think the rebellion really is, I mean, I suppose there's a few, but like it's, it's that we don't just work with one type of person. We don't just do, here's the one client we work with and we're just going to lift everything off the shelf. It's almost that thing when I enjoy it when I speak to people who are from kind of, I've known from more corporate backgrounds I've worked with in the past and they're like, wait, so you live in Portugal and you're doing this. That was the first. Then it's like, Mm -hmm. wait, so you live in Portugal and you're working on a kind of Hollywood film. And, And it's like this, it's kind of the rebellion. I'd say our rebellion is a lot more subtle. Our rebellion is everything on paper about what we're doing shouldn't work as efficiently and as effectively as it has. I think it was Alex or someone said to us about, it's almost like we act like a 
startup, but we're performing on the same level as big corporate agencies. Like our work is just as good, if not better than theirs, but it's more efficiently produced and we can keep that kind of small business feel. So I'd say in general, I don't really like to say that we've like, we're massively rebellious. It's like ours is very subtle, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. It's rebelling against the way that things are supposed to be done, but still doing them just as well and in just as big of a way. And you work with both the Navy and pirates. Um, when doing that, is the code, does it switch up? Or are you keeping like pretty much the same code, no matter whether you're working with big corporations or small groups? Um, yeah, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, very good question. So yeah, it's, it's the same. It's no, we don't change. The, the difference is the big, the Navy will pay us more mm -hmm. in general. <laughs> And it's not they're paying us more for the same work because that wouldn't be fair. So let's use an example of logos. If a, the Navy wanted a logo, we would create a logo for them. And because of the nature of who the Navy are, they need a lot more people involved. They need a lot more say. They need a lot more justification. Um, so they would pay us, let's say, in the thousands to do a logo. And that would include multiple rounds of revisions. We'd have maybe 10 rounds of revisions. We'd maybe give them five different logos up front. We'd have three or four long meetings with them and they'd have a lot of say in it. So that's agreed with them. Whereas the pirates and the kind of smaller businesses and the charities, they would, and the same designer would do both. They would, so that designer, let's say, is going to use 10, 15 days of their time. Everything is agreed above. And by the way, the Navy would get the same options as the pirates and the pirates, unless if they said, absolutely don't even bother wasting our time with those bigger options, they all get the same options. Mm -hmm. It just happens that the Navy go for the bigger ones, which is why we've created it that way. Whereas those smaller logo options for the hundreds, we would get the same designer who's designed logos for some of the biggest brands and designed for them would then instead of 10 days, they might spend one day. And you would get one logo or maybe one or two logos, depending on the, how much. And then you'd get one round of revisions and you wouldn't get loads of meetings with the designer. You'd just get one meeting with me. And the way that my belief of that is and what we've kind of proved can work is if I get you the top of the end designer, but they do something for you, which is only a day of their work instead of their full, long, long whole process, what they're going to get you which essentially would just be like just for a quick day and a bit of fun for them is going to be a thousand times better than what you're going to get from paying like a middle level person, a middle level amount. Mm -hmm. And again, it goes back to my thing of everyone wins because the client can't go. I'd like more versions because well, you didn't agree to that. We agreed to one you agreed to, so you can have our work, have it done cheaply. But then when it's cheap, that means, like I said, everyone has to win. So the designer can't then be going, well, this is cheap. And I'm now doing 10 days of work for nothing. So for them, they've made some easy money for not a lot of work. And for me, it's then less work to manage that because it's a smaller project. So that's, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you, when I first started launching with that, I was terrified that I was going to get it horribly wrong. Mm -hmm. And so far, we haven't had many hiccups on that, that that works well because the using the pirate stuff you said it's mm -hmm. it's laid out before you start working it's painted mm -hmm. out here's how we're going to do it so yeah that's we don't work with them in any different way we don't give any any more special treatment um it's more just happen as you would expect the navy have more money more supplies to put into getting the higher level of our projects but likewise we have done some stuff for navy level corporations on the small pirate level because they go, no, nope, you know what? We trust in you. We know how you can get the work done and we're willing to do that. Just in my experience, most people in the Navy, on they're, they're so set in their ways, they can't think like that. Mm -hmm. And by the way, when, when we're referring to this, I'm not saying we've actually worked with the Navy. This right. is obviously the pirate, <laughs> the pirate analogy of the Navy, the big corporations. And look, when I first started, when I'd left, I was fully in the Navy for years. I was probably trying to be too rebellious. I'm like, no, we're not going to work the Navy ever. And, but you realize that actually 
just because a corporation works a certain way doesn't mean there's not pirates within there. There's not people in those corporations who want to do something differently. And that's where I think we come into it, is helping those pirate thinkers in those bigger organizations roll those things out. And that's one thing like with how to be more pirate too, that really pointed out all, there are a lot of pirates within the Navy, like the looking at how can we change up corporate life? And I, yeah, I worked in, I worked in a corporation for years and <laughs> I, that's why be more pirate really stuck out to me was because, um, I'm like, I want change. I want to see change. I feel I'm so far at the bottom of the wrong. So being able to see how people effectively can make change or even get that conversation going within the corporations. It's like, I loved it. I ate it up. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, it's those solutions. It's, it's just mm -hmm. when you present a solution to someone, when you go, look at this video. And this is why I love the content and why we really morph from social media into general content, making videos, animations, podcasts, all sorts of things is, when you try and explain pirate thinking to people, they just won't quite get it. Whereas when you go, look at this video, look at this, look at this, what we achieved, and people see it and go, that's incredibly impressive. And then they say, but how did you do that? And you say things like, well, I did it from a laptop in Portugal, or, well, actually we did it. And they went, oh, that must have cost, one of our big problems initially was people thinking that we'd cost a lot more than we do for all of our projects because our work was of such high output that people weren't getting in touch and, oh, we wouldn't be able to afford working with you. And I was like, no, that's, that's not the case. Like, actually, and for, especially for some of the cool charities and things, I'd explain what I just explained to you. And it's like, oh, actually, we can work together. So that's kind of my thing of when you make that value, and we both know, we all know this, of with the pirate stuff, of you had bands like the Rolling Stones and music. Like, when people heard that, they couldn't not, enjoy it because it was that good as much as they wanted to stay with their shirt collars done up and their hair cut short and being all prim and proper you can't not enjoy that and that's kind of what pushes me creatively is make things that even if someone goes if someone was to see it's made by picaroons and if for whatever reason they decided they despised me and they didn't like anything to do with the company we're working with and they went to watch that video going i have to hate this if we can make something that when someone watches it, it doesn't matter what their relationship, they can't not have their mind changed. That's kind of my marker of success because that's what then allows you to get into the conversations of well, how we did this. Mm -hmm. And I have, I had so many people, like I said, kind of when I first started this, not doubting me, like I feel like I've had a lot of amazing people around, but more worried for me. <laughs> people close to me were like worried, like, but you're going to brand your business up and call it pirate. Uh, I, that from so many people like your, your logo is a skull <laughs> our logo is a skull which is also created in a way which has to be approachable that's why it's got the cheeky grin and mm -hmm. this was part of the brief to the designer it has to be a skull because it has to be pirate but it has to not be menacing it has to be approachable cheeky and friendly so i've had someone say to me he said Look, i'm just going to give you some advice like a really nice one said i really think you should not talk about the pirate things i was like okay well it, it, I appreciate that. Like, do you want to explain a bit more? And he said, look, it, maybe a better word would be, and I said, before you say the better word, can I stop you? Is the better word disruptive? And he said, yeah. And I was like, shall I join the list of 10 million businesses calling themselves disruptive mm -hmm. when they're not actually, and they don't know what that means. Mm -hmm. I was like, the point for me is by calling ourselves pirates, we automatically deflect any of those, and I don't have a nicer way of saying it, stuck up, boring corporate people that I don't want to work with because if anyone is going to see the work we do and then see a skull and go not for me mm -hmm. then absolutely a hundred percent I don't want to be speaking to them mm -hmm. but that's why I said and what I enjoy is when people see the work we do and the first question I get from a lot of more kind of serious people is can you explain the pirate thing to me? <laughs> and then when I do, they end up really enjoying it and wanting to be pirates themselves and even more they like the business. But as we all know, it's on face value, they see pirate and go, oh, here we go. And I found it in advertising. There's a lot of companies who position themselves in these kind of punk, badass DIY ways. But then when you work with them, they are a bunch of punks. They are drunk all the time or their processes are useless and you don't, like they look cool, but I wouldn't think anything worse than working with them because you can't trust them. 
Whereas my whole thing was, okay, the pirate, and this is what we all know from reading the book, of actually they're incredibly efficient. They're mm. incredibly smart and they didn't need to scream and shout and say, like me speaking to you guys about this today, it's probably the first time I've properly spoken about the way the business is run on any podcast or anything. In general, it's not what I speak to people about mm -hmm. because it's not our marketing point. People aren't going to buy from us because all my freelancers get to have a really nice quality of life. Mm -hmm. They're not going to buy from us because I go surfing a few times a week. Like, <laughs> they're going to buy from us because our work helps them achieve their business objectives. So that's what we speak about outwardly facing. Whereas I think you've got a lot of agencies going, look how punk we are, look how wild we are. But actually under the hood, like things aren't running well. Mm -hmm. And vice versa, you've got a lot of corporates saying, look how creative and amazing we are. But actually you go there and it's the same thing. And actually they're not, it's not a nice place to work. It's not fun. So my mm -hmm. thing has always been, can we do all of them? Can we be incredibly creative in our output, incredibly efficient and really good client services and fun to work and nice to work with? But then also we present ourselves as these kind of pirates who have a bit of a joke and don't take ourselves too seriously. I feel like that's the mix of that I'm yet to really see other agencies or anyone else who can fit all three. Mm -hmm. And I might be wrong. There might be someone listening and be like, we can and please do get in touch. <laughs> but yeah, I'm yet to see any that fit those three. And to be honest, again, you know this, the way that I've built Picaroons, whenever I see an agency or someone that I really like, the nature of Picaroons is they're not a competitor, they're a potential partner. Mm -hmm. So it means I can just get in touch with them and how can we work together? How can we crew up? So it kind of means it's a nice feeling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and collaboration is such a huge part of, of piracy. And you get to do that with the creatives that you work with, um, as well as like, yeah, like you said, it's not other companies aren't necessarily competition, but how can we cooperate and work together, which is really cool um, way of doing business, right, and opens up more opportunities for everybody. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, like you said, it's collaboration. It's Okay, they're better than me. So how can I work with them? How can mm -hmm. I use the fact they're better than me to my advantage? Which, as, back to what I said, everyone wins. How can mm -hmm. I use it to my advantage, and how can I then help them? Mm -hmm. So it just means I never, I, I never worry about competitors because it's just not really a thing for me. And also because in my mind, every business is potentially my client. Every business needs marketing. And there's a lot of businesses around the world. And the nature of Picaroons is we don't need to be doing business with hundreds and hundreds of businesses. We just need a few who are the right ones to be working with. So it kind of is a nice mindset to not be, someone asked me recently about like competitors. And I was just like, I know who are the companies that I really respect. Mm -hmm. I know who are the companies that I massively disrespect, but I don't know. I wouldn't look at anyone and go, oh, they're going to take the work that we should have got. Because mm -hmm. I feel like there's so much work out there for us all. And if there's any that are that good, I want to figure out how can we partner with them and support them with our specialists. And we've got that. There's some agencies who do everything that we do. And I've worked with them and they'll just be doing one aspect of what I need them to do. And I'll be covering another aspect. Like I said everyone wins. No one gets fussy about we normally do the whole process because they're good. We're good. And we can partner together. I... Um... I'd really love to hear more about the podcast that you come you have coming up um, with this yeah. real life pirate. What's what's all about that? <laughs> yeah, so so when we say we're doing a podcast with a pirate, obviously everyone assumes Somalian pirate, someone who's killed people, bad guy. It's the opposite. So if you've seen the film, I think it's called Made in America, or American Made, with Tom Cruise, where he was flying planes called Pablo Escobar mm -hmm. um, and the government, the FBI were the ones who put him in there. That's the most similar thing I can put to mm -hmm. this real life pirate. So in general, he was employed by governments, by sheikhs, by people who weren't, he didn't hurt, he wouldn't hurt a fly, but lovable rogue did a lot of stealing, a lot of stealing of ships and a lot of, moving ships around but again when i say ships i don't mean there was people on a ferry and he jumped on there and took them off i mean this shake is having an argument with that shake that shake has stolen the ship off the other shake 
So Sheikh One, who had his ship stolen, has asked this pirate to go and steal it back. Mm. Like proper, the things that the governments don't want people to know they're doing that are a bit shifty, they would get him to do, mm. which has meant that he's been arrested in all over the world and never been kept for more than a day or two because there's a government connection or someone who will help get him out. He's just an amazing human. He's, when he was 13, 14, kind of ran away to sea, uh, joined a ship, which he then found out was pirates, and he learned everything about the sea. His knowledge and the way he's connected with the sea is like nothing you could ever explain. And his mindset to life through the adventures he had as a pirate, getting caught, caught in storms. Um, he had one, which is kind of the video we made for him, is a very famous story about the Spurn Beach, which was a Humber barge, like a small barge you take down the rivers. He took that from Hull to Jeddah in Saudi Arabia and got caught in all sorts of mischief and storms and shouldn't really be alive today from that. <laughs> and his mindset to how he faces the ocean. And when we talk uncertainty and work, we're talking for him uncertainty in death and life. His mindset to that is something which everyone can learn from in business, in life. In, and he's also, he's just got an amazing voice, as you expect. He is exactly what you'd expect from a he's British, mm -hmm. um, the coolest guy, lovable rogue. And yeah, we're basically creating a podcast with him where we are getting him to share aspects of his story, aspects of his personality. And so for us, as kind of the guys producing on it and doing the wider project, um, which, as I said earlier, is we're looking to turn it into a film and a book as well. We know his story that he's told us, mm -hmm. but he's the type of person that the more questions you ask him and the more you ask him to go into things, he will put a throwaway comment of, yeah, and so I stole a hose and I swam across this 60-metre thing with all these guards and then quickly filled up the boat with some fuel. And I'll go, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> How did you get the hose? How did you swim across with all these guards? Like, and he'll, things that he thinks are just normal mm. because that's the life he lived. And he, they're my favourite type of people, the people, like I said, that have amazing stories. It goes back to kind of my initial thing I did about brands of, Brands have got this rubbish project product that no one needs, no one cares about. And they're shouting about it like they found Mount Olympus. <laughs> Whereas he's the opposite of, he has so many incredible, hilarious, brilliant, and some a lot of time genius anecdotes and stories that he's lived through to tell. But he is very unassuming and thinks it's all just normal and that we've all that we all know what he means about fixing a ship for five minutes in a hurricane just stood outside having strapped himself by rope to the other guy on the ship in case one of them goes overboard <laughs> he think he'll speak about how that's a normal thing so then it's kind of our role as and like i said you guys are doing a great job here i'm really enjoying this of some of the questions <laughs> but it's our job as the podcast interviewers to get him to always reveal more and he mm. is just one of those rare people that you know the further you probe and the more questions you ask the more gold is just going to come out of him so we're putting that at the moment we're creating it and we're hoping for it should be august that we're mm. releasing that and um, it's going to be called original pirate material well, we'll be Thank having you. our eye out for that for sure <laughs> yeah, i think you guys are definitely yeah, sure. yeah. <laughs> and yeah, tell us, um, where can our listeners go to find more about you, more about Pickaroons? Um, yeah, and learn learn more. Yeah, so Pickaroons, so you can go to Pickaroons underscore on Instagram. We're kind of quite active there. Um, if you search up James Berg, B-E-R-G on LinkedIn, I'm very active there as well. Um, then obviously our website, pickaroons.co.uk. We're finally having that updated in the next few weeks to actually have all the work we've done over the last seven or eight months, but we've still got all the work that we did last year. And um, you can get in touch with us through any of the channels there. Kind of always happy to chat to people and see if there's a way we can help with those sales donations or leads. As I think I've covered, there's a lot of different things and ways we do that. Um, and then, yeah, if you're interested in the podcast, so if you look up original pirate material on Instagram, you'll be able to find the podcast, uh, the page there same for facebook and soon we'll have the podcast coming up there 
And then the podcast I've got with my dad is called Chats with Dad. You can look up Chats with Dad, I think, dot Buzzsprout. It's on Buzzsprout, this or chatswithdad.com. I'm not quite sure what the website is actually we have for that. But basically, wherever you get your podcast on all the channels, if you search up Chats with Dad, you'll be able to find that. Um, well, there's a few things. Right? So the other one's my book. If you'd like to read my book, 104 Social Media Content Ideas to Increase Sales, that's available on Amazon. Um, and yeah, I think I'd probably bore you if I went on with all the other links. <laughs> That'd be enough to at least if we're, if you're interested enough, get started. Mm-hmm. And as totally. I say to everyone, give Be More Pirate a read. It will explain yeah. a lot more of some of the things I'm saying about pirates in a lot mm-hmm. more detail. Yeah. And completely in, intrigued by this whole conversation. So we're good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad. Thank you for having me. It's been really good fun. Um, so one more question. How would you recommend our listeners going about starting their own pirate life um, and taking some small, bold actions in their life to make change? Yeah, it's a really good question. I mean, I think my, my thing is about, and I speak about this a lot on the podcast, of looking at what you want your life goals to be. Not your business goals, not what step, where do you want to be? So when I was 19, I decided not even by a time, I just said, I want to be able to work from a laptop and I want to be able to go around and travel and take break through the day to go surfing or snowboarding or skiing or whatever and then go back to my work. I want that freedom. And then when I look back, that's never, that hasn't changed at any point, no matter all the uncertainties and horrible things that were thrown at life as it does to everyone, that's never changed. And I think by having that focus, when I look back, all the steps I've taken, all the options I've had, the option I've always taken has been leading me towards that. So mm-hmm. it's most simple. I knew I needed to have a skill. A skill is what allows you to work with different organizations in different ways from a laptop. I was like, okay, well, how do I let people know that I've got a skill? Well, I need to have an excuse to talk about my skill. And that was where the book came in. And then that was where all my focus was, where do I go with the decisions? does Pickerooms become a social media management company? No, because if I do that, then I probably need more of ongoing client relationships and an office and a physical location. Mm -hmm. So I'd always say to people, map out, what do you want your life to look like? As in, my dad says this, he's like, how many kids do you want? How many family do you want? Where are you living? Like, what's your perfect day? Mm -hmm. What's your lifestyle? And then once you've mapped out, what does your lifestyle look like? Then map back from that and go, what steps do I need to take? And I just think really the pirate thing is just, it's, it sounds cheesy, but it's like never accepting that there's no other option. This was never not going to happen to me. If it was going to be when I was I'm 30 now, but if it was going to be when I was 40, I was 50, like it was never not going to happen that I was going to work from a laptop and be able to travel around. That was mm. always, always the thing. And I think it's just, once you know that and it's really what you want, it means that every time you get hit back, knocked back, told no, change that, you're like, okay, fine, here's a different option that's going to get me to that. And that's my real belief is like have something that you genuinely, some, and it's, got to, it's almost got to be a bit unrealistic. And mm-hmm. that would never happen. It's got to be a bit like that. And then you'll find yourself, like you said, be brave. Mm-hmm. You, you then will be brave because you know what that end result could look like. That's kind of my, sorry, I know that's not the shortest of answer, but that's like, that's basically what I believe on the pirate step. It's having that yeah. dream. Here's a life I want, but that life, not the business, not the business, not the job, it's the lifestyle. Because I think a lot of people want to be a CEO. They want to have a company. I'm telling you, as much fun as I have, like even just having a company, there's a, a lot of tough <laughs> stuff where I think, oh, this is a bad idea. Like this is tough, and it's that. But nothing changes in my head of okay, but this is allowing me to live this life I want. Mm-hmm. So that's fine. Whereas I think a lot of people, I want to be a CEO because I'm a CEO. And then do they want to be on holiday and they can never turn their phone off? Is that something they thought about? Is that part of their life plan? Mm -hmm. My life plan, I was okay with the fact that I'll be working six, seven days a week. As long as on every single one of those days, I'm doing something fun. That was my life plan that I chose. So that's always my thing to people is choose that life plan. And then, yeah, go back from that. Yeah, I love that. I I do goal setting uh, with my clients. And the first thing we start with is the perfect day. What does your perfect day look like? Well, I wake up in a cabin in the mountains. Cool. You you live downtown in a city right now. So first, we got some work to do, right? Love it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and 
and I can't, I can't remember what the word you use, but I, I use the word um, unreasonable. Like, let's be unreasonable with our goals, right? That's so good. I'm stealing that. <laughs> it's the yeah, pirate way. Like, yeah, exactly. That's so good. Yeah, be unreasonable with it. Be like, there's yeah. no way I'm ever going to do that. Yeah. Love that. Yeah, when you set the goal, you should be so far from it. That's mm-hmm. the thing. I suppose it's your thing. It's like, be, mm-hmm. you know, be had goals. Yeah, be big, hairy, hairy audacious, audacious goals. goals. Yeah, exactly. Like, set the goal where you're like, like how would, when I think back to, I, suppose I haven't really had to think about this, so thank you for making me think about it. <laughs> when I think back to when I set the goals, it was like, I didn't even have, I was studying, I think, PR. I had like a knee operation or a shoulder operation or something, so I couldn't, I wasn't being active. I'd that I was and I was like right I want to live somewhere where I can surf most days or, or snowboard or whatever it was mm-hmm. at the time like most days I can be active I can also jump back and forth between the UK and wherever I am if I'd like or any country and never have to actually be away from home so when mm-hmm. I say traveling it's not like I'm a digital nomad like I'm living here in Portugal now that's where I've settled that but then I jump back to the UK and when I think back to that that this is so far removed from where I was at. This is so unreasonable, as you said, Mm -hmm. for me to have ever thought this could have been my life. But by setting that, committing to that, and then always seeking those steps, that's what's got me here. Yeah, Yeah. I'm going to use that more now. So that's, I actually changed my answer to be your answer. (laughs) My answer is now you need to set unreasonable goals and just go for them. That's my new answer. Well, and that's, it's the pirate way, right? That's, that's your compass. We're not, we're, yeah. we're, we're off the map. We're living off the map, um, but we've got our compass that helps us to, you know, set the direction of where we're sailing, um, which is, which is awesome. And so aligned with, you know, everything pirate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Love it. So yeah, the unreasonable, that's very good. That's what you need to do is be unreasonable with your goals. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But not with your clients. No. <laughs> <laughs> so we have one final question for you. And it's a very important one. Do you know any pirate jokes? Do you know any pirate jokes? Mm-hmm. Um, oh, there was one I heard recently that was so good. Oh, that's going to annoy me because I heard it the other day. <laughs> um, no, I think I know the punchline, but I can't remember the joke. Oh, no. No. Well, you Can I did... Google one? And we yeah. That we can't <laughs> Otherwise, you did. I don't know how you're planning on cutting this, but I'm a Google one. I'm going to find it. Okay. <laughs> and then you can cut this part out where I'm actually looking for the joke that I wanted to Sounds find. Sounds good. <laughs> you you yeah, have you know, a lot more faith in our editing ability than we do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm going to find it. Or we leave it and we just laugh. <laughs> we just laugh. Here it is. Okay. <laughs> okay. Right. So, what is a pirate's favorite doll? No idea. No idea. Barbie. <laughs> <laughs> but I also, and one of the things, if the pirate, if Captain Tones is listening to this, that's like a stereotype. That is obviously Hollywood films is like, Arr. but it's still a great joke. It is. <laughs> so yeah, hopefully we can cut the part where I had to. Hopefully you can just cut a lot of that podcast anyway. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. It, it all point. stays. It's all gold. It all stays. <laughs> <laughs> no, so guys, well, thank you very much. I've had a lot of fun. They're really good questions. And it's always fun talking about and with pirates. It was awesome to have you. I'm learning so much more about pickaroons. Mm-hmm. That's always the aim. <laughs>